Have your powers faded too? The charm. That's it. Use the charm. Have you forgotten the charm of making eyes? Who's he? Hello, Promethean Fire Thieves. I'm Oliver Perrin for Semiagog, and tonight I'll be talking about progressive sorcery, about intersubjective magic. I discussed aspects of this in a previous clip in the Esoterica thread entitled Meme Magic. This is also just another take on branding, which I did a clip on recently. By now, the more perceptive among you have noticed that my interest in esoterica overlaps almost entirely with my interest in branding. So think of this as a kind of a follow-up clip on the subject of branding as well. I encourage those of you who find this sort of thing interesting to check out those uh, previous clips. One is entitled Meme Magic and the other Branding for the Right. Both touch on different aspects of marrying identity with value and seeding the combination thereof in the memory and imagination through the use of images, with particular attention to context and how that can be used to alter meaning. In this clip, I'm going to pick up from there and talk about how the commies, progressives, leftists, socialists, and other such uh, flying monkeys use language to constrain which images are admissible to the memory and imagination and how they are permitted to articulate based on imposed social mores and conventions. Before I get started, I want to remind you to follow this channel on BitChute. The platform is growing and there are lots of people who've been kicked off of YouTube who, uh, who basically just migrated over there. YouTube could press the uh, eject button on me at any time, so follow this channel on BitChute. Now to the subject. Speaking for myself alone, I've seen sufficient evidence to come to the conclusion that cultural Marxists and other commies are consciously engaged in a program of sorcery. By this I mean that they are attempting to manipulate the masses through what the brilliant Romanian scholar Ioan Culianu referred to as intersubjective magic. I encourage all of you with an interest in esoteric subjects to read his book, Eros and Magic in the Renaissance, which lays bare the transition from police state power to magician state power, which is a transition that many people today have begun to feel, to sense in some fashion, but are not yet able to put into words. So let's set forth a basic definition. Intersubjective magic is the art of stimulating and reshaping images within the target subject. The images I refer to are the ones in our memory and imagination that we use as the basis for consideration, contemplation, reasoning, and decision making. In short, these are the images that influence our behavior in a very real sense. These are the images that shape how we react and respond, that shape what actions we take in the world. Such manipulation is termed intersubjective because the operator, 
propagandist, spin doctor, or talking head that stimulates the reactions must first come to know them, must first activate them within him or herself. The AP has just broken some new news. Um, this has just come out from the Associated Press. This is incredible. Trump administration officials have been sending babies and other young children. Oh. <laughs> to at least three oh. put up a graphic of this thank you do we have it no three tender age shelters in south texas lawyers and medical providers just i think i'm gonna have to hand this off yeah sorry that does it for us tonight we'll see you again tomorrow these days outrage is the emotion they like to generate within themselves. And when they do so, never forget that the aim is to stimulate the eruption of the same emotion within you or anyone else who happens to be listening. Given that the emotions are themselves central to the experience of the subject, to subjectivity itself, central to what each of us experiences as most meaningful in life, it's no surprise that the sorceress techniques employed by the left rely heavily upon manipulating emotional responses and thereby rewiring the subjective experience. To those of my viewers who've closely examined identity politics, this will all be familiar since I'm just talking about that same old shit from a different perspective. That perspective being an explicitly magical one, which was once the subject of a great deal of attention in our culture. Times, however, have changed. Today it's all about controlling the narrative and shaping discourse. In the old days, we had a more straightforward understanding. Words could be used to form spells. And when this was done for nefarious purposes, it was deemed sorcery. But we don't think about it the same way today. Instead, what the propagandists at the New York Times and elsewhere do when they select pictures to go with their headlines or headlines to go with their pictures in order to emotionally frame the exposure to the information is called editorializing, communication strategy, or even public relations. Anyway, to illustrate what I'm talking about, I'll give you some examples. But first, let's take a look, a quick look, at the old idea of incantations used in conjuration or invocation. One of my favorite ways to look into things is to trace the old meanings of words. So our first word is conjure. We've got the old French at the roots of this term, meaning invoke or conjure, 12th century, itself coming from the older Latin conjurare, to swear together, conspire from a come, together with uh, yorare, to swear. Note the inherent sense of rendering judgment together. The magical sense is from approximately 1300 for constraining by spell or commanding a demon to do one's bidding. The phrase conjure up for cause to appear in the mind, as if by magic, is attested from the 1580s. And the 1580s was an important time. But we can't go into all of that just now, so let's look uh, at our next word, which is invoke. Late 15th century in English, from the old French forms, 12th century, again coming from Latin, this time from the word invocare, call upon, implore, from in upon, um, and uh, vocare, to call, related to the uh, noun vox, voice, from the uh, Proto-Indo-European root, meaning to speak. The sense or meaning of both words obviously overlaps quite a bit. Conjuration, or conspiring together. Invocation, or the calling forth of a thing. And both terms refer to outcomes achieved through incantation, through causing a people to sing together in a chorus, so to speak. If I'm right, and incantations of some sort are being used to conjure or invoke magical results, then we should be able to clearly see how the singing of a song, a song of imaginal manipulation, 
and more particularly a song sung together by a group as a kind of social chorus is used to impose the will of the manipulator on the target victims of the sorcery. And indeed we can. In fact, this approach seems to be the one most favored by the uh, globalist forces of progress. This has been noticed by others, by many others, but not quite in the way that I'm looking at it, not from the perspective of occult manipulations, which is simply to say hidden manipulations. I was recently listening to a discussion recommended to me by one of uh, the channel followers, Mr. Nick, whom I think of as the Carolina Reaper. He sent me a link for a Big Cat Kayla discussion where she was speaking with someone going under the name Horace the Avenger. I listened with interest to, uh, to this particular bit. We're working through these particular messages, and I will only repeat the enemy's phrase to insert my own. And to keep, and it's just a matter of repetition. You can actually, if you don't think this stuff works, even on smart people, and I don't care how nosebleed your IQ is or how, how high the IQ is in your household or the guys and gals you're living around or whoever, whatever your circumstances are, you're listening to this. But you can start right now today. That's the wonderful thing about any of this stuff. You can test it for yourself, which I've done for years. And you can start using the word anti-white and just start talking casually in conversations, you're watching this. Yeah, well, that's from the anti-white perspective or yeah, but that's from the anti-white point of view. But yeah, but they're just anti-white. Just keep using it around friends and families off and on and, and with a greater intensity over the next, let's say, two or three weeks. And pretty soon you're going to see that they're starting to use it, not even conscious of the fact that they're using it. I've seen this over and over again when people are amazed at how this stuff works. And I, I just explained to them, how do you think someone ruled the West with words like racist for the past hundred years? It isn't by accident. It's by repetition over and over again, forcing it into everyday conversations. That's why you're hearing the word anti-white right now is because someone forced it into the conversation over and over again, just pure repetition. It isn't a mass, it isn't activity you can have, um, you really even need a lot of people for. There's less than a half dozen first original bugsers, as they were called. And the, the group really took off when there was like three dozen <laughs> reseeding this stuff online. But if you have a lot of people doing it, you can make a huge impact almost like overnight. Now, this guy gets it, or I should say he gets some of it. His understanding is superficial, but sufficient to permit him to undertake manipulations of his own. He has correctly identified the exoteric mechanics. Mind you, I'm not saying he's wrong. I'm just pointing to how others have conceptualized what I'm talking about so that my own perspective, which I think is a more broad one, one that is more deeply rooted in our culture, will stand out more distinctly. Sure, from his perspective, it's all just a repetition, just a kind of semantic conditioning. But if you look at it from the perspective of magic, with all its long-standing cultural associations, you might just crack open a whole new arsenal of tools, a whole new arsenal of weapons to fight back with, simply because you'll recognize it as what used to be called sorcery. Anal nathrak uthvas bethud doth hel dienve. Anal nathrak Again, go read Eros and Magic in the Renaissance by Kulianu. He's the first one who explicitly identified that the modern brand and advertising guy is following directly in the footsteps of people like Giordano Bruno, who sought to establish methods of manipulation that harnessed the sympathies inherent in the world soul to bind imagination through desire. Just look at the barbarous names of invocation favored by the communist manipulators of speech. We've got diversity, which references the black 
writhing maul their witch doctors use to splinter cultures, and so they mouth it like a black chorus. Problematic is the red chalk they use to mark with curses, the people, places, and objects that offend them. Do better is the gutter mantra they repeat to themselves as they wade waist-deep in the shit with which they fill our streets. All of them, dull and deadly as a mudslide, mouthing their words, demanding that their words be repeated by others, stupefied by their own venomous recitations of schoolyard chants. It's no coincidence that once upon a time, the darkest and most forbidden books of spells were called grimoires, which is just another way of saying books of grammar. If one bothers to look at the social engineering going on in the world, the changes that have been affected over the last couple of hundred years, I'm sure that many instances of this sort of thing will stand out. The introduction of new words, the introduction of fashionable new behaviors to go with them, all of them tarted up with every species of emotional cosmetic, the hot pink of adolescent sexuality, the bruised purple of infantile disappointment. All these words are barbarous, which is to say uncivilized barking that carries no real meaning other than serving as a kind of scaffolding for outrage. Again, barbarous words of invocation, a term from the good old days when sorcery was still recognized in the West, a term that could not be better suited to describe the ceaseless and grating jabbering that we're all subjected to today. I don't have time to go into uh, many other examples that occur to me, but you'll think of plenty on your own, I feel sure. I'll offer just one more related to the destruction of family relationships and hierarchy to create a power vacuum into which the socialist state continues to slither once upon a time, we had titles for men and women related to their birth and status or social standing. We used to have ladies as distinct from those who were merely, for example, good wives. But even the good wife could be good, if not a lady. Just ask goody so-and-so. But this was superseded after the American and Jacobin revolutions and the um, aftershocks of Europe's encounter with a certain Corsican of Italian stock. The subsequent democratization of the terms lady and gentleman made them available to all, regardless of birth. No more goodman and good wife. Instead, we all became ladies and gentlemen. And among the ladies, we recognized two categories, Miss and Mrs. But to remove the married couple from the signs acceptable to social reckoning, we brought in Ms, a nauseating word, a crass progressive innovation purpose built for acceptance in America, the land of lazy vowels and indistinct consonants. Suddenly we had a whole new category of women, one that admits of no relation between female status and anything having to do with pair bonding, reproduction, or the raising of the young and we began to repeat it. We began to print it on magazine covers and on business cards. Barbarous words of invocation. And what comes next? Why, a host of genders, a seemingly endless assortment of them, all with their own new linguistic terms ready for insertion into daily speech. Now that family and child rearing as a basis for social distinction has been whipped and scourged from our imaginations, we have arrived at this notion that the very sexes and human sexuality itself, that all of this is up for a complete progressive revision. It's time to do better, is it not? Just look at the slime trail left by these Marxist lexical impositions, this whole social engineering program designed to replace the family with the state. There are some who react to the leftist outrage engine with outrage of their own. I think that this is probably not the best approach. And there are those who enthusiastically recommend that we take up the weapons of the left and use them to engage in our own 
linguistic manipulations. This too is suboptimal, or so it seems to me. The fact is that the foot soldiers of global social progress are little more than scolds. An era of unrestrained vituperation, of endless reprimand, rebuke, censure, and hot-faced neuroticism is coming to a close. I, for one, will be happy to put a period to its existence. And to do this, I think we would be best served by becoming cold and pitiless. Hysterics create and feed upon more hysteria. So let us cut them off. The way to do that, I think, is to speak out against this subversion of our language, to utterly refuse to coddle or tolerate it, but not in an angry way. I think the solution lies in not reacting emotionally to any of this. The solution lies in strictly limiting emotional displays to clearly circumscribed areas of private life. Therein, those of us who enjoy Yankee cuss fights can indulge our vices as we see fit. But outside the home, in public life, I think we should become much colder, much, much colder, and much less patient with the babbled incantations of those who, regardless of their gender, speak with a witch's forked tongue. We should become much less accepting of those who make their living by spreading fever dreams and social sickness, all while the blood trickles down the inside of their thighs. Perhaps then a chill will come over those who favor these sorcerous manipulations of language. Perhaps we'd soon see these hysterical social convulsions cease. If not, there's always the scold's bridle, or perhaps better still, the heretic's fork. Get it? Got it? Good. Semiagog out.